Hey there students, the 2019 AP European History exam has been administered. I hope you all did great, hope you all got that bread, and now it's time for the reaction. So let's go ahead and get into the AP European History 2019 free response, and I'm going to give you my reactions, and when there are cases where I can choose between questions, I'll let you know what I would have chosen and why. Now, first of all, we've got the secondary source, okay? So on the SAQs, the secondary source, and this is a pretty straightforward, just about a four-line excerpt um, from a book called A People's Tragedy, The Russian Revolution, which was published in 1997. And so this is going to, of course, focus on the Russian Revolution with a little bit focusing on historiography. So describe one piece of evidence that would support the author's characterization of Russia's political culture prior to the Bolshevik Revolution. Now, before 1905, okay, so what he is, what he's saying here, what the person is arguing is that Russia was never really, uh, you know, they had a weakness in democratic culture. So that's really his thesis as far as why did Russia fall to communism the way it did and especially fall to communism as the author is putting it without popular support. And so the thing is, what is it about Russia's culture that represented a weakness of democratic culture? And what I noted here was Russia was an autocracy prior to 1905. Remember, before the 1905 revolution, there was no representative government. And even after the 1905 revolution, there was minimal representative government because the Tsar had a veto over anything that the Duma decided. So with that, we would note that Russia was an autocracy before 1905 and arguably even after. But if you said anything to do with the autocracy and provided some kind of specific example, I think that you're good there. B, describe one piece of evidence that would support the author's interpretation of Russia's new autocracy in the 1920s and 30s. And what I thought about here was Stalin's forced uh, starvation of the kulaks, uh, these people who had resisted collectivization of agriculture in Ukraine and elsewhere. And so with that, of course, remember what we're talking about here. There's not a right or wrong answer here. There are a lot of answers. I'm just letting you know what I would have put here. And for C, where it is asking, what is something where we could differentiate between the czarist autocracy and the Soviet autocracy? What I noted here in my answer was that the Soviets persecuted the Orthodox Church, whereas the Tsarist autocracy supported the Orthodox Church. So anything that is a difference between the Tsarist regime and the Bolshevik regime, I think should be fine. Now then we go to the primary source, which is typically a visual, and they didn't disappoint us here, and they sure didn't disappoint me, okay? Now, of course, the first one was great for all of the people who, during the reviews, are like, Russian Revolution, Russian Revolution, Russian Revolution. I got so tired of talking about the Russian Revolution, really. But what I never get tired of talking about is neoclassicism. And those of you who participated in the premium art review that I did the night before the exam, I think about 115 of you, we focused on neoclassicism more than any other art movement in that presentation, in that, uh, that webinar. And so with that, thank you, College Board. Very cool, all right? So with that, we can see here neoclassicism and specifically as it relates to the Enlightenment. Remember that art movements, it's not so much about being able to describe the technical features of this art movement, but being able to place it in historical context. With neoclassicism, we're thinking in terms of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. And so the thing is, describing one way in which the image expresses ideas popularized during the Enlightenment, the use of reason rather than violence and rationality over emotion. We can definitely see that in the in the painting here. And of course, that is part of um, the whole enlightenment thing, the focus on rationality uh, rather than uh, emotion. And also, we can even see that there is a lion that is being uh, brought to heel, that it is cowering. So we are not using violence, we're using reason rather than force. 
Describe a way, this is B, in which the image reflects the policies of the French revolutionary government's radical face. And what I'm noting here is Liberty is wearing a Republican cap. And also fanaticism. Of course, fanaticism here typically represents in uh, the Enlightenment terms the Catholic Church, which was, of course, uh, illegal during the radical phase with de-Christianization. And then finally, describe one way in which the ideas in the image continued to influence European political thought after 1815. Uh, what I focused on, I focused on classical liberalism and or Greek independence would have been great things here. Because remember, the 19th century classical liberals were basically moving forward with the ideas of the Enlightenment. Now, then we get to three and four, okay? Now, of course, I can see on my paper here for number three, where it's talking about the English Reformation and Henry VIII, I wrote divorced, beheaded, died. I was like, oh my goodness, Henry VIII, that's going to be so awesome. But then I looked at number four, the questions about the Industrial Revolution were actually, in my view, easier. Now, I, I could answer all of them for number three. Of course, I teach this course. I should be able to, right? But when I see 3C, where it's talking about uh, the difference between the effects of the Protestant Reformation in England and the Protestant Reformation in France, um, I felt it was a little more advanced than what was asked for here. So remember, anytime we're looking at the SAQs, the obvious topic may not actually be the easier one. So with that, uh, I went to number four and one cause of Great Britain's early industrialization in the period 1700 to 1800, I noted natural rivers allowing for hydroelectric power. Now, I don't know if hydroelectric is the word for that, but water power, right, for the mills. Now, you could also note inventions such as James Watt's steam engine or uh, property rights or central banking and some of the things about the British economy uh, that were there. Um, so another thing you could have noted as well would be the abundance of coal. So natural resources in general. So natural resources, inventiveness, and or specific features of the British economy at that time. Describe one effect of Great Britain's industrialization on the European balance of power in the period 1800 and 1900. Now, I think the British Empire would be the most obvious development there uh, because the British definitely excelled anyone else in that. I also think you might be able to make a connection with the unification of Germany if you note that the Germans in the 19th century industrialized with the support of Bismarck. I think that could be a good answer too as long as it's linked back to the British Industrial Revolution. C. Explain one political reaction to industrialization within Great Britain in the period 1800 to 1900. I felt like the most obvious example of that would be Chartism. But then again, you could go into so socialism, specifically Marxism, or anything else reacting. Also, uh, Romanticism, which may not have been political, so I don't know if that would be my first choice, but that would be another potential reaction to industrialization. Now we go to the DBQ, okay? Now the DBQ, I've got a couple of things about that I'm not crazy about. Uh, even though I like the topic, I think it was cool that the college board went and decided that for both Euro and A push, they would revisit the same period of time. So all these people who are trying to guess when the DBQ is going to be, I've always told you, don't try to do that because they can always do the same thing they did last year. So they are in the 17th century. Now, what I don't like is the way that this prompt set up and I've complained about this before because the prompt is set up it says evaluate whether or not the Catholic Church in the 1600s was opposed to new ideas in science now whether or not does not invite the student to make a nuanced argument so I personally would have preferred and evaluate the extent to which the Catholic Church uh, supported or opposed new ideas in science or something like that or just a evaluate the extent to which the Catholic Church supported and letting uh, the student come up with a nuanced argument. Now, another thing when I see in the 1600s, 
come on now, are we really dumbing down the exam that much and getting that anti-intellectual that we can't say 17th century? The documents make it obvious that that means 1600s, but sometimes the dumbing down of this exam just kind of gets to me a little bit, where on one hand they've dumbed it down, and on the other hand they've made it more complicated. Uh, so with that, but the main thing is the whether or not. I don't think that this is good for students who are not initiated. Now, I tell my students, watch out for whether or not, because that's not what they're asking. Because to get complex understanding, you're going to have to go beyond whether or not. You're going to have to be nuanced. And so I think that that's something that the test makers really need to take into account, that if you want the student to uh, demonstrate complex understanding, then you need to ask for it. Now, with the documents, I thought they were kind of interesting here. Now, one thing I want to note, though, is that a lot of people, again, they're expecting a yes or no question and they don't look into the nuances of the document. So I feel like the documents were well selected as far as nuanced. We've got a lot of different perspectives here. Now, for the context, I went into the Counter-Reformation, uh, the Jesuits, the Council of Trent uh, also had a little bit about the scientific revolution. The problem with contextualization, I found, was that a lot of these things were mentioned in the documents but not really elaborated upon so when I would have done a more focused contextualization I did a broad I did a lot more I, I ended up doing I think about two-thirds of a page of contextualization whereas I'd usually do about one-third of a page so with that, I think that the documents were pretty accessible for the most part. I think they allowed for arguments. I will have my actual response online soon. It should be linked in the description. So if you're curious about how I answered this prompt, um, I said that there's a combination of public condemnation, private admiration, and of course, Jesuit curiosity. So I noted that although the Catholic Church publicly condemned these discoveries, uh, there also was a lot of support here when you think about what people are writing in private. I think that the documents are very well set up to create a nuanced argument because here in document six, we've got Jesuits playing with telescopes. When Jesuits are playing with telescopes, the Catholic Church can't be opposed to science forever because it's, it's just not. You can't play with telescopes and all of these tools of empiricism and permanently condemn science. So I think there was even some room for continuity and change over time and framing that as far as it going into even later on if you're looking for that so-called synthesis point, noting that the Catholic Church eventually made amends with science and you really don't see any kind of conflict today. Today the Catholic Church uh, doesn't even claim that that, uh, human evolution, which of course contradicts the creation narrative in the book of Genesis, uh, the official position of the Catholic Church is that that doesn't necessarily violate any fundamental Catholic doctrines. Now with that, I also want to note that that document seven was just pure savagery and I think everybody enjoyed this document uh, that I noted here, POV Savage, press F to pay respects. So those of you who are watching, go into the comments, press F to pay respects to our friend Rene Descartes. He needs it after that. This was, this was something. Now then, where it said something along the lines in the last sentence, and finally, following Descartes' reasoning, there can be no conversion of bread and wine in the Eucharist into the body and blood of Christ, which favors heretics. Ladies and gentlemen, guess what I wrote there? Let's get this bread. <laughs> and then, of course, I crossed it out. Uh, but anyway, we decided before we went to the exam, let's get this bread. And then all of a sudden, there was bread in the DBQ. How cool is that? It's almost like the college board was like, hey, Richie, we're going to try to make an exam that's just almost perfect for you. And in that case, I definitely appreciate it. So, so far, I'm really a fan. I feel like the SAQs were really straight forward. The DBQ, again, I think that that prompt phrasing is misleading and I hope that the test development committee will consider that um, in asking for nuance in the prompt. But then we go to 
uh, the LEQs, okay, the LEQs, which are, of course, grouped by period, and we see here that this is going into causation. This is actually a new format. This is a prompt format that I don't believe has ever appeared on the redesigned exams for the AP histories. So we have something that is directly targeted to causation. So far, we've seen comparison prompts, continuity and change over time prompts. Now, note, I think that the continuity and change over time prompts prompts really lend themselves to causation as well, but all of these start with evaluate the most significant effect. Now I like the diversity of prompts here. One is about state centralization by European monarchs, the new monarchs and the reformation. Uh, there is another one about population growth in Europe in the period 1700-1800. And then finally the last one, evaluate the most significant effect of the Great Depression in Europe during the period 1929-19. And of course, we know where that's going, okay? Are they Nazis, Walter? I think we're going to see a lot of Hitler, Nazi Germany, which uh, is, of course, one of those things that your essay is not really going to be about the Depression, but the effect of the Depression, which was, of course, the rise of Hitler and the Nazi Party as a viable political force and not just a fringe party. So I would have written my essay on the prompts are two, three, and four. I would have picked prompt four, the last one, the one about the Great Depression in Europe, and I would have focused on uh, the rise of Nazi Germany and, of course, going into World War II. So that's really... Take, you know, just a slow pitch over the plate, and here's some stuff that most people are familiar with. Now, one thing I think you're really going to have to know what you're talking about here if you answer this one, because everybody thinks they know something about Hitler and the Nazis, and a lot of people really don't know as much as they think they know. It's the Dunning-Kruger effect. You know a little bit about it, kind of like what might have made some people jump for that Henry VIII English Reformation prompt, even though the questions about the Industrial Revolution were actually easier to answer and lower level. So you want to be careful about that. The people who picked like prompt three on population growth in Europe, they're probably going to be able to squeeze out more points with a less thorough analysis with that. But at the same time, I felt good about my knowledge of the rise of Nazi Germany and Hitler. After all, I've got a three-part lecture on that. So I would have picked that. My second choice would have been the European monarchs. My third would have been population growth in Europe. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, it's nice to finally see causation prompts and see kind of the format that they're be, going to be going with. So it's nice every year when we see the redesign 2.0 or whatever it is, uh, that we're learning a little bit more about the exam. And I think that next year we're actually going to be see some tweaking of the SAQs as well. Hopefully at some point we're going to get in a good rhythm. But again, aside from the phrasing of the DBQ prompt, I'm extremely pleased with how this turned out. So thank you, AP Euro Test Development Committee. Very cool. Thanks everyone for watching, and it's always a pleasure.